Hello students, uh, this is Moshmi speaking and uh, this is your second lecture. Um, the first slide of this lecture you can see is the, a very nice picture of the Hanley uh, telescope, uh, the Himalayan Chandra telescope. So what is detected using this telescope is the spectral lines from galaxies and especially the interstellar medium. And that is what this lecture is going to be mainly about detecting the emission from the interstellar medium. Now the emission from the ISM is one of the only ways in which we could really study the composition and uh, the activity, dynamics, the energetics, all the things, because we can't uh, really get close to the ISM, so this is our major way. Now there are three types of emission. Uh, uh, there's emission, there's absorption, so emission lines and absorption lines, and there is also continuum emission. Now I have shown you a, a picture at the bottom of a spectrum from uh, a quasar, a nearby quasar, 3C293. And as you can see, there is um, a straight line going up towards the right hand corner. And this straight line is the continuum emission. And you have some uh, emission lines here, and there's one of them is H alpha, the others are the N2 lines. And you also have absorption lines, a sodium absorption line in this figure. Now emission lines, as you probably understand, are given out when an atom ion molecule is go, goes to a higher excited state and then comes back to its ground state or in between state. It gives off photons and those photons we can see as emission lines. And the emission lines as they come towards us, they are often absorbed by dust or intervening medium. If it's absorbed by an intervening medium, then we can see what is called as the absorption lines. Now both these types of lines, absorption lines and emission lines have their own characteristic shape. And we are going to discuss that in this lecture. The last type of emission, which I have discussed on this slide, the continuum emission, as you can imagine, comes from a continuous stream of wavelengths of frequencies. So this, if you recall, is similar to the emission that you see when electrons impinge from a heated anode to the cath heated cathode to the anode, they are at all different velocities. When electrons or any charged particles are accelerated, they give out photons. And those photons will be of a continuous range of frequencies. And that's why you see a continuous range, which forms the lower backbone of the spectrum given here in the figure shown here. Now, there are three main factors which affect the emission line shape, and we'll go through them one by one. The natural line shape, the Doppler broadening, and the collisional broadening. The natural line shape comes from the natural vibration or frequency of the atom. Now, this is something that is best treated quantum mechanically, but since we are not doing quantum mechanics in this class, I will just treat it classically, like a damped harmonic oscillator. So we have the damped harmonic oscillator equation given on this line. You can see here, gamma is the damping factor. And the damping comes because when an electron vibrates and gives out the energy of frequency nu zero, the emission that is given out also causes a damping effect on the vibrating atom. So that's why we have a gamma factor. And this gamma damping coefficient for, um, uh, for an atom is given by e squared omega squared divided by 6 pi epsilon c cubed by m, where m is the mass of the electron. So here we will not, um, we will not go into how this expression came. It is a quantum, mechanic, quantum mechanical um, factor. And you can just go back or we can discuss it later when the classes reopen. 
And I haven't done the maths here. I would have if we were in the regular classroom. But I think you can all go to Dyson and Williams or some other textbook and see how it is derived. We get finally from this expression, the solution will be that of a decaying electric field. And the electric field will have an amplitude. That amplitude E squared will be proportional to the intensity of radiation that is emitted. So that is given by this expression over here. There is, of course, another Fourier transform that is required in between. So I nu is given as I0 gamma divided by 2 pi omega minus omega naught plus omega squared by gamma squared by 4. Now this line shape, if you plot it, it has a very distinct uh, shape. And you, may, you have probably come across it in other aspects of your physics classes. It's called a Lorentzian. And the line center is at omega zero. And there are broad line wings, we call it, line wings. And I will just quickly show it to you on the next page. The Lorentzian is this figure that I am showing with the pointer. It's got very nice broad wings on either side. Now, as I mentioned earlier, that uh, the de proper derivation is given as quantum mechanically. And if you do that, then one of the Einstein's coefficients A will be equal to 2 gamma. And 1 by A is the occupation time in the upper level. Then if we use the uncertainty principle, we'll find that the spread in the frequency is, is given by H. Uh, Planck constant divided by pi into gamma. So the frequency spread is directly proportional to the damping. Now the second, the second uh, effect which is very important for the line shape is the Doppler broadening of lines. And this is probably the most, most important broadening mechanism discussed in astronomy. And that's because in astronomy, in the ISM, for example, uh, the medium is nearly a vacuum, or nearly a pure vacuum. And so collisional broadening or even sometimes the natural line shape is not as important, as strong an effect as the Doppler broadening. The Doppler broadening, which you all know and we have discussed in class earlier, the Doppler effect is due to the uh, due to a particle moving away from us or moving towards us. So we get a broadening delta nu of the line due to an average velocity spread of V. So delta nu by nu zero is equals to V by C. Now, if the atoms have a thermal distribution, let's say a Maxwell distribution of velocities, then the uh, using the Maxwell's distribution, dn is uh, proportional to the exponential of mv squared by 2kt, then we will, we will be able to put in this expression, the expression for the intensity that i is proportional to exponential of nu minus nu naught squared by 2 delta squared. Now this delta squared, if we use the Maxwell distribution, is nothing but mu squared by c squared into kt by f. <coughs> now the Doppler spread produces, as you can see here, a nice Gaussian profile for the line. And I've drawn a cartoon here. Um, it's, it's not a very good cartoon, but um, I'm sure if you look up anything on Google, you will find a comparison, a similar figure. The Lorentzian is the broader component and the Gaussian profile is the narrower component. So the Gaussian profile, which is used, which is due to the Doppler broadening of the lines, is the one component that produces the central peak in the line. If we see a broader component or what we call the wings, that could be due to the Lorentzian profile underlying the Gaussian profile. Alternatively, what is very common in interstellar lines is that there is not just one Gaussian that is fitting the line. There are maybe several Gaussians. 
And that's because there may be several broadening mechanisms working uh, in the interstellar medium. So I've just mentioned here that this Doppler broadening can be due to turbulent velocities of clumps in clouds. It can be due to, for example, the motion of very dense clouds near the supermassive black holes. Um, it could be due to the random velocity dispersion in the H1 clouds. So whenever we see a line broadening in the interstellar medium emission lines, we will first try to fit it with a Gaussian and then that will tell us something about the energetic behavior in that component of the ISO. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a, a single line is often not uh, a single process. So there is uh, no single underlying process producing one Gaussian. It is usually a combination of two or three Gaussians. Now, this makes it very difficult when the line is weak to separate the different components. So another way to measure the strength of spectral lines is to use what is called equivalent widths. And equivalent widths is nothing but, uh, it's an integration of the difference, the strength of the line I minus I naught divided by I naught. And I want you to look at figure 2.2 in Dyson and Williams. You can also look at any other uh, figure on the internet for equivalent widths of spectral lines. And you will find that it is nothing but a rectangular box type representation of all the emission underneath the line. So we can write it both in the frequency domain or we can write it in the uh, wavelength. Now to simplify this expression for W and especially to uh, ascertain an expression for weak, strong and moderate lines, it's important to use the equation of radiative transfer. And I think most of you have studied radiative transfer in the first JAP lectures. It would have been covered. So I'm not covering it again here. What it is simply is that D nu, uh, di by ds is equals to minus kappa i. The decrease in the emission is due to the absorption by the intervening medium, which has an absorption coefficient kappa. Now, this is, of course, only relevant to an absorption line. If, if, if it was an emission line, then kappa would be negative, or there might be some emissivity in the medium in which case there would be another component to this equation, which would be J nu. But right now, I'm just considering a simple absorption line. So then the equation is very simply solved. We get I, I lambda is equals to I naught into exponential to the power minus tau lambda, where tau lambda is the optical depth of the intervening medium and the optical depth is, is nothing but the integration of kappa ds. So we can write the familiar expression w is equals to integral 1 minus exponential of minus tau lambda d lambda. Now again here we will have to use some of the quantum mechanical treatment uh, because tau lambda if you use uh, quantum mechanics and you take the oscillator uh, oscillation of electrons or atoms in the intervening medium, then tau lambda is equals to pi e squared divided by m e squared. And then there are two more factors here which are unknown, phi lambda, which is the normalized line profile shape. F is the oscillator strength of the absorbing atom and delta lambda is the frequency range. So we can put this in the equation and we can then solve the three regions. The three regions correspond to weak lines, moderately strong lines, and very strong lines. Now, I'm going to now talk about the three types of lines. And it's very simple, as you can see on the slide itself. It is all depending upon how we take tau lambda. For weak lines, 
tau lambda will be very small, so we can take it to be much less than one, in which case the e equation becomes very simple and W is equals to tau lambda delta lambda. And so for weak lines, especially if we take chi lambda is approximately equal to one, we get a simple expression W is equals to pi e squared by mc squared into fn lambda zero squared. So you see something very important here. The equivalent width w is then proportional to n. So for weak lines, the equivalent width w is just proportional to the number of intervening atoms. This is what we typically mean when we say optically thin medium, optically thin. Now, let us suppose we have moderately strong lines, then delta lambda could be one or a little bit larger. And then if you just do the, uh, and the maths involved, you will find that W then is given by an integral, which I would have solved if we were in class, maybe I will give for homework, but W finally is proportional to log n to the power half. So this is the second part of the uh, equivalent line plot. The last part, the absorption in the line rings becomes very important. And then the line profile becomes Lorentzian. And I haven't worked it out here, but W is proportional to n to the power half. So now these three regions, we can plot them on a plot. And that plot is called the curve of growth, the curve of growth. And I've done it here. I've drawn another cartoon here. So ln w, log w, and log n are plotted on the y and the x axis. And you see a rising part when this medium is optically thin. When the medium becomes a little thicker, then it's practically flat. And when it becomes very strong and there is a lot of absorption in the wings, line wings, then you will find that ln w is proportional to n to the power half. So this is called the curve of growth and it is widely used in uh, studies of the interstellar medium, especially when we want to see the absorption by different um, ions, like for example, a silicon or um, sodium. We can draw these curves of growth. It also is very important because it tells us these particular lines that if we know what is the equivalent width, we can get a uh, read off from this curve an approximate estimate of the number of atoms, column density of atoms along the line of sight. So just to uh, summarize what we are understanding from spectral lines, I've just made three points, three or four points here. It tells us, first of all, if we look at the spectral line, the central velocity or frequency of the line will tell us that what is the relative motion of the cloud or system with respect to us. This is just the basic, where is the line from that central frequency. Now, if we look at the broadening of the line, we will find out what is the turbine velocity inside the glass gas. So if we see, for example, uh, an H1 emission line from the width of the line, I'll say, okay, inside that H1 cloud, there is so many kilometers per second turbulent velocity. And that's very important because you may want to study the energetics of the cloud. So the line width is telling you something about what is happening inside the gas cloud. Now, the next third thing is, what is the column density of atoms or molecules inside the cloud? This can be derived using the equivalent line widths and the curve of growth. That is very important for people who do very detailed studies of interstellar lines. And of course, if we know the number density and we know the local depth, we can also find out something about the temperature inside the cloud, the temperature and the optical depth. Now that I've told you something about uh, the emission lines, I want to tell you, I think we should discuss what are the sources 
where are these emission lines and absorption lines coming from in the interstellar medium? Now, each wavelength, each waveband, radio, optical, infrared, gamma, uh, maybe not gamma, uh, UV, these, all these regions have spectral lines and you will be able to see those emission or absorption lines. But right now we're just going to de discuss the two most important uh, widely studied uh, wavelengths uh, in India. The first is the optical, okay? In the optical domain, the emission and absorption lines can come from atoms and molecules, but also a lot of ions. So if you have, for example, a singly ionized oxygen molecule or atom, O1 or O2, it can get excited to a higher state and lose another electron and come back and it will give out a typical line. So you have optical emission lines from different species in the interstellar medium. Now, the uh, approximate wavelength, the approximate wavelength can be determined, as I mentioned in the previous slide, from the central frequency. So the line may sometimes be redshifted and finding out lambda minus lambda zero will tell us something about the redshift, how far away it is from us. Now the line shape can, is very important in optical. Sometimes you could have several lines together. For example, the calcium triplet, you have two or three calcium lines, ionized states of calcium together. You also have absorption lines. The sodium absorption line uh, is a good example. 5890 and 5896 Armstrong. The, probably the most exciting and the most relevant one for most of you is the H alpha light because the H alpha light is the most common line in the visible part of the spectrum. It's at 6563 Armstrong. And I'm going to show you a picture. Yes. So I'm going to show you a picture in SDSS spectrum of. Um, uh, a central region from a galaxy. And you can see here, the central line is H alpha. And on both sides, the N2 emission line is there. There is the S2, the sulfur emission lines here. This is a doublet, we call it. And it's very characteristic. The emission lines all have very characteristic shapes and they will be always associated with other emission lines. So that's how you're able to recognize them. Now, the other frequency which I wanted to just discuss with you is the radio emission lines, the radio range. And in the radio range, the first line that all of you must probably be aware of is the neutral hydrogen line or the H1 line, the H121 centimeter line. Now, this H121 centimeter line comes because of the spin flip between the um, atom, um, the uh, proton and electron in the hydrogen atom. It's called the hyperfine transition, F, F is equals to zero and one, parallel, antiparallel and parallel electron proton spin states. And it has a very long decay time scale, actually something of the order of 10 to the power seven years. Now this is very surprising because we see H1 very commonly in the universe. And when we do radio observations, it's very easy to detect. However, that's because H1, neutral hydrogen, is a very common, um, a very common atom in the interstellar medium of these galaxies. And because of its abundance, we are able to detect it. Now, apart from neutral hydrogen, there can be other species. I've not discussed that here. There can be uh, molecules and there can be atoms. The molecules I'll discuss in the next class because the molecules have various different types of vibration and rotation, different types of transitions. But here I will just mention other atomic lines that we see. We see lines such as uh, the carbon lines. Those are very important. C1, C2 lines and um, the other atoms like oxygen, uh, iron. So we, we see this, but in the radio regime, H1 is probably the most common. 
before I end, we should look at an H1 spectra. And I've downloaded one. The spectrum is NGC 4701, and it's from the high pass data release. And you can see that it's unlike the uh, optical lines, it's not a single line, it's got a double horn structure. Now, this double horn structure, if we were in class, I would have asked you what, what, what's causing it. Uh, many of you probably guess it's due to a rotating disk. So if neutral hydrogen is in a disk, rotating disk in a galaxy away from us, then some part of the disk will be coming towards us, some part will be moving away. And that's why we see a double horn profile. Now that's really interesting because if we can just measure the velocity difference between the two horns, then that will tell us what is the velocity of rotation of the disk. Of course, we have to also include the inclination angle of the galaxy, but it gives us a very good estimate. So this is the end of the second lecture. It, uh, the slides will also be available on my website, and I will also send them to you. Please take care.